This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 316, recorded on December 19th, 2014. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to... To TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. How are you today? I'm well. It's a beautiful day here. Cloudless sky, three degrees Celsius. Excellent. We got 68 degrees, few wispy clouds. 68 degrees, I don't know what that is. What's that, about 18? Well, 68 is 20 C, exactly. 20 C, exactly, okay. That's one of the, the Celsiuses that I can transmogrify immediately. And the other one is 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212, right? Yeah, actually, one of the letters today, I, uh, I was reading over them, and I saw the weather reported in degrees Celsius, and it made sense to me right away. That was because it was plus four. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's my cold room. I know what that is. And then there's zero Celsius, which is yeah. minus 32, right, F? Right. Also. Uh, sorry, 32. Yeah, I say I get all screwed up. You'd better introduce Kathy because Kathy, she yeah. really wants to talk. Also joining us from <laughs> southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Sometimes people can't Hi, resist. Uh, yeah. And I don't blame it. I think it's fine. Yesterday on TWIM, Michael Schmidt just jumped in and started chatting with us. And, okay, let me introduce Michael. <laughs> what do you got out there for weather? Uh, 28F minus 2C, kind of cloudy sky. Hmm. Oh, we have Man, I don't here. think I could handle it anymore. You Rich, know? do you have do you I'm have clouds? Uh, do you have clouds? Or you have clear skies. We here? No, we have cloud- uh, rich condit. Uh, rich, yeah. Uh, few, a few high wispy clouds. Oh, okay, no big deal. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be introduced. And Alan has <laughs> the most I've- patience of us all. And I have the most clouds of us all today. I you think do? we have we have overcast. It's th- thirty five Fahrenheit, two Celsius, um, and it's not raining or snowing or anything. But uh, got a low overcast layer, so everything's kind of gray. Alan, if we started doing a paper and we hadn't yet introduced you, would you pipe up? I would pipe up at that point. Yes, I see. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody. We have our final live twiv of the year. Um, wow. Right, is that right? So you, you're going to put really up a recorded scary. episode. Yeah, for- I'm going to put up a pre-recorded episode next weekend, which will be recorded in Brazil. Okay, that was a lot of fun with students and postdocs. It was okay. cool, and um, then the following week, which will be January second, we are scheduled to do Twiv. I guess we'll review the year, right? Yeah. Yep. Just mm-hmm. talk about Ebola. <laughs> Yes, that'll pretty much cover. <laughs> no, that's only it. the past six months or so. Yeah, we got other things to talk about. Lots of cool things, and uh, we'll talk about the year in TWIV. But today we do have science. We have a paper. We have some follow-ups, or is it follows up? Mm. Uh, that's a good one. Sapphire I would say follow-ups. I, I think it's follow-ups. Okay. It's from Christopher. Greetings. Twivologists. It's currently a nice, typical December day, 73 degrees here in San Antonio. <laughs> I'm just going to jump right in here. So, about the discussion on the sick sea stars, I have a few questions that just weren't answered satisfactorily for me with this. I feel like we're going to get a bad grade, you know? Yeah. If it isn't clear, cut, that all the sea stars that are sick have the virus, and if it isn't clear, cut, that all the healthy don't, why not? If the virus is present in the healthy and in the sick, but there are also sick ones without it, might that suggest that the sea stars were somehow immunocompromised and that the virus they found was simply opportunistic? It wasn't clear to me that they controlled for this possibility. I can't possibly be the only one to suggest this, especially since there were so many authors on the paper. I wonder how this was ruled out. While I guess the weight of evidence is towards the virus being the culprit, I would have loved to have seen some bases covered or maybe just to have some answers for a few basic questions. How common is it for sea stars to have similar signs when sick? How did they rule out other causes of illness before filtering and sequencing? How common is this virus among non-sick specimens in the wild? 
without that information and the small sample size, how were they were able to determine that this correlation wasn't merely a statistical fluke? How well were they able to control for contamination? If they're just blending, filtering, and injecting, it could be any number of these small infectious viruses in that concoction. A bigger question is, with that method, how are they controlling for contamination? In general, rolling with the idea of, quote, those they found are that are infected but healthy just aren't sick yet, unquote, feels a bit, mm, shaky, special pleadingly hand-wavy. I would have liked for them to have attempted to tie a nice bow around this. To get around those holes, what are the options? Vincent suggests culturing and infecting out of the purified virus. That would be great, but in the absence of that, what could they do? Kathy suggested a second round of sequencing, but if you're infecting them with what was infecting the other stars, everything that infected the old ones should infect the new ones. And if you do this a few more times, to be sure, don't you run the risk of attenuating or even just selecting non-naturally occurring traits that could possibly throw you off? Well, I guess if it was a human virus, it'd be easier to ask and answer these questions. Are these questions naive? Are these even questions that virologists would ask? Or are there better questions that need to be asked? I am keenly interested in your perspective. I would lum- love to someday be a virologist. Well, I got news for you. You already are a virologist. Yes. <laughs> you're on your way. <laughs> and you're well on your way to being somebody's reviewer number three. <laughs> These yeah. are these are definitely questions a virologist would ask. Um, there there are others that that uh, I think we brought up as well, but uh, these are ones that we didn't specifically delve into. And um, yeah, these are some of the reasons why this is not uh, not a complete lock at this point. Right. All good questions. Excellent no answers questions. for any of them. Yeah. So the thing is that this was a lot of work as it was. There was quite a bit of sampling involved in that paper, partly, and that's partly why there are so many authors, I think, from different locations. And the numbers of animals they sampled were was pretty high. And, you know, they have a lot of data. They decided to publish it rather than wait for the story to be tied with a nice bow, as you say. If we always waited for the story to be tied with a nice bow, then there'd be a whole lot fewer publications, which you know might be a good thing, but it would take a whole lot longer to get to. Yeah. to yeah, sometimes it's a good idea to throw the stuff out there so that other people can see what's going on and maybe make a contribution. Yeah. I have a feeling, that I don't know the answer to this, uh, Christopher, but I have a feeling this is a unique illness, and that's why they've noticed it, this melting um, and the series of symptoms that we discussed, and um, it's unique. It's it's extensive on the West Coast, as we mentioned, um, and so that's what you know. To answer one of your questions, I think that um, that this is what pointed them towards looking for for an etiologic agent. Um, contamination. They did not uh, take the columns and run water through them and sequence that, if I recall. And that's now getting to be sort of a uh, a standard. You know, last week we uh, we discussed the one paper about the human orange, oropharynx uh, algal virus. Right. Mm-hmm. I, w- I went to the PubMed, and, and now, now you can make comments on PubMed, and someone was saying, why didn't you sequence the water controls? <laughs> and And one of the authors responded, well, we didn't think it was necessary. And then the guy said, well, it is. Why didn't you do it? Can you tell me why you didn't do it? <laughs> at, at which point he didn't answer anymore. But, you know, because, um, uh, what's our friend in San Francisco, Eric, Eric Delwart, he found that the columns can have contamination themselves. I think from now on, you really need to do an experiment where you run water through your columns that you're using and sequence it just to be sure. It's a good idea. I know it's, you know, it's not that expensive. Sequencing is cheap. In this case, for proof, I really like my idea of trying to get a full-length genomic clone and infecting the animals with the DNA as a shortcut yeah. to culturing the virus, because yeah, that ought that. to work. It might. Uh, what they don't have yet is the full-length clone, and getting yeah. inverted terminal repeats might be problematic. Right, and, and if the DNA is infectious. Should be, for a parvovirus. Well, I think. you know, the thing is, uh, you may not have the right sequence, you know, it's uh, it could have mistakes that you don't know about. Right? I guess you could make, make sure you preserve the open reading frames, make sure the ends are right. Yeah. If, if you can get the full sequence, though, that would certainly be uh, an easy thing to try. And then are you going to introduce it, uh, the DNA into primary sea star cells? He wants to do it right into the sea stars. Right into the sea stars? Yeah. Put it in the coelomic cavity, Rich? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever that is. Put a, How about a gene gun? You could just 
shoot it in with a shoot gene it gun. in. Yeah, right. you just inject them. You wouldn't yeah. want to electroporate them, probably. <laughs> no, they would really <laughs> melt yeah. with all that salt in the water. Yeah, that would be something. But um, that's a good idea. I like that. It's, it's probably easier than. Um, Making a culture and infecting. Yeah, so. because then you know, then you get into all the stuff. You could spend years and go belly up trying to make a culture. I mean, well, maybe I, it would work, I, and that would be the ideal way to do it. But uh, you know, you could yeah. land on the rocks doing that. Hey, you give it six months, you know. Right. Yeah, no, don't do it forever. Anyway, hopefully that that helps, uh, Christopher. But um, keep listening. You know, you you ask good questions. They're all great. Yep. All great questions. I'm not sure it would be any easier with a human virus. No, I think it would be more difficult because you'd be, be harder. you know, you couldn't do the experiments. Right. You couldn't yeah, shoot C- the human. Sea stars are not, uh, they're not super easy like mice, but at least you, you know, people aren't going to protest when you try to work on them. And you can ask them questions. Yes, because apparently <laughs> if they can show symptoms, then they can talk. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of... So, so they interrogated the sea stars. Robin writes, symptomatic echinoderms. I guess one of us said symptomatic at some point. I'd like to meet one, he writes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it would be talking. It would be very strange, yeah. The sea Every, Everybody wants to meet the stars. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. That would have been a good title for that episode. Yeah, uh-huh. I'd like to meet one. Oh, the sea It is the body cavity rather than the gut. Right. Okay. In animals with three germinal layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and entoderm, the coelom is formed within the mesoderm, separating the mesoderm into two layers, the somatopleur that goes with the ectoderm to form the musculoskeletal system, and the splanchnopleur that goes with the endoderm to form the musculature and connective tissues of the gut. I just felt like I read something of a foreign language. Yeah. Splanchnopleur. Splanchnopleur. Splanchnopleur, I think it is. In humans, the coelom is divided up into the cavities of the pericardium pleuri, peritoneum, and the tunicae vaginalis testis. I didn't know we had a coelom. Well, now you do. Gosh. Sure. There's so much I don't know. Next thing would I be know. to take samples from applicants for graduate and postgraduate programs to check for chloroviruses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. And the ones that have it, you don't you reject, right? And maybe there is a reason for Baltimoreans, intelligence tests for mice. Mickey Mouse? We didn't mention Baltimoreans, did we? No, we didn't. We we know. were we were uh, very careful not to do that, but Robin but did you. it, so <laughs> right, he did so, it for yeah. us. Okay, and that's our follow up. Thank you, Robin. We have a paper today, which is in PNAS, entitled "Interleukin Ten Modulation of Pathogenic Th17 Cells During Fatal Alpha Virus Encephalomyelitis," and this is from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. They added Bloomberg there when he gave a lot of money to the school a number of years ago. He used to be our mayor here in New York City, Mm -hmm. Michael Bloomberg. The authors are Kulsar, Baxter, Green, and Diane Griffin is the PI, a very experienced and well-known virologist there. Now, In the pre-show, Kathy asked me why I picked this paper, right? Or how it came to your attention or whatever, yes. Yeah, it's Uh, it's, uh, actually not what you said. Oh, come on. She said, Vincent, what are you thinking? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, no, no. I don't, it's, you're seeming to put a negative spin on it and I didn't. Yeah. I I don't think I asked it that way. I I was just curious how you found it. I did put a negative spin. That's why I paused and waited for you. (laughs) When you're about to speak, I can hear your your breath intake. Right, so right. Anyway, yeah, you said how did uh, how did I come across it? So I scanned the papers every week, and um, it it um, it sounded interesting. I'm really interested in first of all um, immunopathogenesis, and I had just been at a committee meeting on Monday of a student here who. Is working on EMCV, encephalomyocarditis infection of mice, and she has good evidence that it's immunopathological damage in the CNS. And I came back to my office and I saw this paper and I said, oh, we have to do this on, on TWIV because this is a cool topic. And also, it's heavily immunological, and I do tend to shy away from those papers. I'd, I'd say run away. <laughs> <laughs> run fast. I, I have to admit, I'm very insecure about Immunology. Me too. I've been I've been uh, anticipating this, saying that I was going to play Caleb 
on this <laughs> on this show. I'm thinking I'm going to be well. Dixon. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, well, Kathy, I, I kind of I, expected I, you might know something about this. Yeah, I, I kind of do. But yeah. now okay. I'm really out of luck. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So. Um, <laughs> So, audience, you can quit listening now, or at least come back in about twenty minutes when we're done with this. All right. So this is, so this will illustrate why I, I have always shied away from immunology. There is actually an aspect of innate immunity that I've always liked, and in fact, my lab works on it because you don't have to deal with cell populations; you deal with molecules. And as you'll see, we're going to be dealing with cell populations here, and it just they they proliferate. And they, yeah. they multi, as soon as someone finds another one, it gets added to the mix. So, however, I do want to improve my uh, myself. <laughs> I yeah, don't know we, if that... we have to we have to embrace our fears here. <laughs> and uh... however, the, the the overall question though is when a virus infects you and you have symptoms of disease, uh, and signs, signs of in signs of disease, and symptoms, and I like flu like symptoms, and tissue damage. What's causing it, the virus or the immune response or a mixture of both? Right. And for many, there are many viruses that don't actually kill cells. They're not cytopathic. And so disease in animals is largely immunopathological. That's the word that we use for it. In this paper, they're looking at encephalitis, virus infection of the brain, uh, using a mouse model and asking what's the role of the immune response. And um, they, um, they study... Uh, Synbis virus infection of mice. Synbis is a mosquito-borne uh, virus that causes encephalitis. And, you know, there are a number of viruses out there that cause encephalitis, and people like West Nile virus, um, and of course, chick, they say, also causes some neurological disease, chikungunya, which we haven't talked about yet on TWIV. And so I, I spent a little time with this. This is, because, um, you know, these RNA viruses confuse me. Sorry, Vincent. <laughs> but this is in the family Togaviridae. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an icosahedral virus that is actually enveloped outside the uh, mm -hmm. icosahedron. That's why they call it toga, because it's got a toga around it. That's right. what it looks like in the EM. But it's still got, you know, uh, virus attachment proteins sticking out from the capsid through the envelope to the outside. And uh, so that's the family. There are two uh, genera. Alpha virus and uh, something else. Ruby, uh, Ruby. Ruby virus. Yeah, rubella virus. And right. within the alpha virus, there are in excess of 30 species. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of which you have mentioned chick, equine, uh, eastern equine encephalitis, um, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, western equine encephalitis. Uh, semi-leaky forest virus, Synbus virus. There's all, uh, I guess, all of them mosquito-borne, and a lot of them causing this these uh, encephalitis-type diseases. Oh, and I forgot to say, we're talking single-stranded positive sense RNA that uh, has a uh, is uh, interesting or characterized by making a subgenomic RNA for the synthesis of uh, capsid proteins. So there you go. So this is. Um transmitted by mosquitoes the natural there's a reservoir host in in the wild of birds and it's transmitted uh, among birds by mosquitoes and people get bitten then uh, they the virus can infect people and it can cause arthralgia rash malaise etc so and it's a model it's used as a model in the lab for studying uh, encephalitis, and you can infect mice, and they and they actually, I think they use a neuroadapted virus for these studies. But you infect mice, and they develop fatal encephalomyelitis, and you can ask what's causing it. And previously, a lot of work has been done on this model, which indicates that the immune response is quite um, a significant player in 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 the, the the damage in the CNS that you see during infection. In fact, you could even say that the model was developed through a series of gain-of-function experiments. You uh, so could I say think that. The, I think the virus was passaged in mice to select for a virus that caused uh, uh, neurologic symptoms so that it would be a model for yeah, the that's uh, right. neurologic disease in humans. Yep. Hey, you know, the, it was decided at this National Academy meeting of the past week that that's a bad term. Hmm? Yes. Mm. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I, gonna, looked for a re I looked for a... You know, a thorough report on that meeting, and I saw a small write-up somewhere that I couldn't find again. But I couldn't find like the whole meeting or anything like that. Yeah, there was a there was a short write-up in Science um, 
they webcast the meeting. I didn't I didn't manage to get to it, but I don't know if they have archived it. Um, the ideal, though, would be a full write up that you wouldn't have to sit through the whole meeting for. Right. Hmm. Yep. I'm going to restrain myself. Why didn't they hire you to do that, Alan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I didn't angle for that job. I don't think I would have been an appropriate choice. Hmm. Um, having staked out a position on it, I probably shouldn't be hmm. somebody who's covering it. But that is the kind of work that I do and enjoy yeah. doing. All right. So. Well. Uh, back to this, um, there's previous evidence that the immune response is a key player in the damage in the in the CNS, the central nervous system, when you infect mice with Synbis virus. So you can inhibit immune responses and show that um, neuronal death is caused by uh, the immune response. You can inhibit the inflammatory response, which is what happens when uh, viruses infect the CNS. Um, but in this paper, they want to drill a little deeper. They want to get granular and find out exactly what part of the immune response, and in particular, uh, what kind of T-cells. T-cells were previously implicated in the immunopathology, so they're going to ask, what kind of T-cells are causing the damage in these mice? So you, you inject the virus directly into the brain of mice. It replicates. Uh, it causes encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, and then the mice die. They get paralyzed. They die. So the first thing they do is they're focusing on an, a, a protein called interleukin-10, or IL-10, which is a key cytokine that determines how the balance between inflammation and regulation occurs uh, in, during the immune response. So it can influence the presentation of antigens by cells. It can influence the differentiation of T cells can determine what other cytokines have, are produced and the overall extent of uh, inflammation, that is, the response to being infected. Um, they noticed, so they look at IL-10 during infection of these mice. They actually, I guess they use intranasal inoculation. Hmm. I, should, I said I see, but that's Intra wrong. It's intranasal. Oh, yeah, right. I do see intranasal. Because um, mm -hmm. that's what we used to do with polio. We used to stick it right in the brain. Um so, okay, it's intranasal, and then they measure IL-10 levels. See, uh, you should have done some gain-of-function experiments with polio to make it aerosol transmitted, and then you could have done intranasal. Right, Vincent. I was just not a creative guy. I'm sorry. There you go. There's so many good things you could do. Yeah. I actually think that would be an interesting experiment. Um, because in people, the people thought for years that polio infected people via the nose, via the olfactory right. nerves, you know. Turned out not to be true. Um they look at IL-10 levels, and the messenger RNA encoding IL-10 increases in the brain and spinal cord in the course of infection of mice. All right, so it goes up when you infect mice. So the, that says to them, let's look at this. It could be important. So they then get mice that don't have the gene for IL-10. It's been disrupted in them. And so they infect these mice in the same way with their virus, and they find that in mice lacking IL-10, disease is accelerated. Uh-oh. <laughs> right. Bummer. A, a more rapid onset of paralysis. Earlier death, mean day of death, eight days compared with 10 days. And um, this accelerated progression um, occurs during the time when IL-10 is increasing in, in wild-type mice, which is about five to seven days after infection. Now, the differences aren't huge. If you look at these graphs, you're gonna, you would say, what? But there are differences, and they're statistically significant. And sometimes that's what you have to go on. You know, it's not going to be always binary. Okay, so IL-10 seems to make some difference. No IL-10, worse disease or accelerated disease. So it's like uh, this, this, this paper is so twisty, multiple negatives that I have to keep my head straight on this. Oh, okay. yeah, I had the same issue, right. So, <laughs> so that means that IL-10 normally serves to... To make uh, disease to less limit bad. The right. disease. Right. right. Generally right. thought of as anti-inflammatory. Yeah, anti ah, good. good. That's the Excellent. word. Yeah. Anti-inflammatory. So IL-10 is doing its normal job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons they looked at IL-10, because it's right. known to be. All right, so why do you get accelerated disease? Let's try and figure this out. All right, so what they do is they 
um, when the virus is infecting the CNS, you get inflammation, which, among other things, is accompanied by immune cells coming into the brain to try and clear infection from the periphery because the immune cells aren't normally in the brain, right? They're in the periphery in the circulation. And when the brain gets infected, cytokines are produced that draw the immune cells in. So they say, let's look in the brain and see um, what's there. So the number of cells... And the amount of inflammation, which you could assess by making sections of the brain and staining it and, and looking, you can give a score for inflammation, uh, increased after infection, but it was the same in wild-type and IL-10 knockout mice. Okay, so no effect there on, on the number of cells that are coming into the brain and the inflammation between the two uh, strains of mice. So then they look at some other cells, particularly myeloid and lymphoid cells, uh, two, two types of cells that are part of the immune system. And they say, we can do flow cytometry and measure these because they're markers for each one and say how many of them are, are, are here. And there are no differences in the numbers or percentages of microglia. It's a kind of macrophage in the brain. Natural killer cells. CD4 positive T cells. Those are the helper T cells. Or CD8 positive T cells. Uh, which include cytotoxic T cells. All right, so no, no differences in numbers or percentages of those when you compare wild-type and IL-10 knockout mice. They did find that wild-type mice had more monocytes. All right, I'm not sure what that means, but the IL-10 mice had more neutrophils. So they say, aha, maybe neutrophils are the, are the key. Turns out not. They do another experiment where they deplete neutrophils in IL-10 knockout mice, but it doesn't make any difference. Doesn't Presence or absence didn't alter the disease course, so they don't think the neutrophils are explaining why IL-10 is having the results that it's having. See, this is the problem with having so many different cell types in immunology. Yeah, it goes through you each one. you got to keep looking. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. And they could go on like this for quite a while. And they do. <laughs> they do, yes. <laughs> but stay, stay with us. Out, yeah, then you run out of cells, and you find that it's none of the above, so you get a new cell. Exactly. You find a new cell. I yes. was just going to say that, yes. And, and I <laughs> discovered a new cell in this paper that I didn't know yeah, about before. Right. We'll get to it. I'm not sure I could explain it very well. But All right. Um, then they say, let's look at CD8 and CD4 T cells because they've been – Implicated T cells have been implicated previously in, in uh, the Synbis infection, so maybe IL-10 is altering that. So they do flow cytometry and cytokine staining. You can get an idea of uh, the numbers of each of these two. Um, five day after infection, the percentage of CD8 positive T cells, and these are there are multiple types of CD8 positive T cells. Some of them make granzyme B, which means that they're basically cytotoxic T cells. They're going to be lysing virus-infected targets. Those are lower in IL-10 null mice than wild-type mice. So that's probably not playing a role here. The number of CD8 T cells that make interferon gamma were similar. Okay, so um, the, it's a different type of, of T cell. Interferon gamma would be released to uh, interfere with virus-infected cells. So... Um, so all the usual suspects have alibis. Yeah. So basically, right. <laughs> differences in CD8 cells do not explain um, the difference in disease in, C in IL-10 null mice. And now we've done like a year's worth of work so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully the person doing it is very patient. And when Diane Griffin says, all right, you got to look at this next, they don't say, I, I say I've had it. No more. <laughs> They're in an immunology lab. They've got to be used to this. <laughs> well... You know, it's also dependent on the person and how persuasive the PI is. Yes. Okay, now, that, now we're going to look at subsets of CD4 positive T cells. Now, maybe some of you remember that CD4 positive T cells are the, the helper cells. They produce cytokines that help make antibodies. They help differentiate cytotoxic T lymphocytes and a bunch of other things. And there are several subgroups of C CD4 positive T cells, of course. <laughs> <laughs> there's Th1 and Th2. Those are the famous ones. And then there's a more recent one, which is called Th17. And and just to remind you that there was no difference in the number or percentage of yeah. overall CD4 T cells. But they're going to go ahead and look at the subsets anyway. So this is an interesting point, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 
as an, as an immunologist, you would, you would know that there could be differences in the subsets, which wouldn't reflect in the overall differences in the numbers, right? So, right. They could be swamped by the overall. Well, this is true of, of lots of measurements. You could be measuring a, a population, and you're missing the um, you're missing the trees in the forest. Right. So again, you can use flow cytometry and staining for cytokines to figure out what are the different amounts of the different subsets of, of CD4 cells. So again, in this in the brain of mice infected, it can be wild type or it can be IL-10 null mice. So five days after infection, this is when you first see signs of neurological disease. Uh, in IL-10 null mice, there was a five-fold increase, increase in the frequency and in the number of IL-17 producing CD4 positive T cells. Now, CD, uh, TH17 cells, we should say at this point, these are traditionally believed to provide antimicrobial immunity at, micro, at epithelial barriers, but they can also create inflammation and tissue injury. Okay, so this is why they're looking at these, this subset. They are implicated in a number of autoimmune diseases like yep. uh, MS, right, uh, diabetes, right. etc., Crohn's disease. And now, it was a paper that I blogged about last week. It's a very interesting paper where they infect mice with influenza virus, and they find gut pathology in these mice. And the reason is, uh -huh. the reason is when in the lung, when the virus infects there, um, helper cells move from the lung to the gut, including Th17 cells. Uh, they alter the microbiome, and that screws up the gut. So Th cells go from the lung to the gut in those influenza-infected mice. And then they mess things up because they can be immunopathological. So these guys go up. These IL-17-producing CD4 cells go up. Um, and that was five days after infection. At seven days, same thing. Also get an increase in interferon gamma-producing uh, CD4 T cells. So the TH17 th cells look like they're, do they're going up in tune with uh, neurological damage. Party. Time out for a party. <laughs> Are you okay, and yeah, yeah I mean, and not only in the brains, but also in the spinal, spinal cord. cord. Yes, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, They have a lot of numbers in this text because they put all the p-values and the percentages, and it gets very um, difficult to read it. I can understand that it would be hard. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, actually. I read it through the way I ordinarily read a paper and tried to, uh, you know, the way I ordinarily read a paper is to go through and they come up and do an experiment and then I stop reading and I look at the figures and see if I come at the same conclusion. And that was very difficult for me in this case. And I went back and read it again and just read the text and it was a lot easier on yeah. me. Yeah, the, the data are, so much of the data are in the in the text. Yeah, yeah I so, think you can do do well with just the text, yeah. I did the opposite. I just started, I read the abstract, and then I just looked Good at figures. the figures. And how'd that work? And, and that uh, kind of worked okay. Sometimes I had to go from the figure to the text, and then and then eventually I just read the text. You know, I did. I started with figure one, and I mm -hmm. said, there are no differences here. They <laughs> 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 were really small, and then I, so I had to read the text and let them convince me <laughs> yeah. that these were different. Well, they are different, but it's really, really, um, as I said, it's not binary. So they also look at IL-17 mRNA, and this goes up as well in the IL-10 knockouts compared to wild type. Um, and there's also another cytokine, they, or chemokine that they looked at, which is produced by Th17 cells. It's called CCL20. Uh, and these go up in the spinal cord, but not the brain. So basically, um, these Th17 cells start coming into the central nervous system about the same time as paralysis begins. So they are in the absence of uh, IL-10. These go up, but not the Th1 cells. So both Th1 and Th17 are present in uh, wild-type animals, but only Th17 go up in the IL-10 knockouts. Okay, so far, Rich? Yeah, I'm good with this. Okay, so, so far we've implicated Th17 cells as perhaps um, mediating this uh, CNS damage. Now, ooh, <laughs> now we're going to move on to um, a few other um, markers. So what, what is it with the Th17 cells? What are they doing um, that, that, causes the, that is associated with the disease? So they take these uh, 17 cells from the brain 
of an infected animal five days after infection. They look for the production of various sign proteins that are implicated in um, pathology. So one of those is granzyme B, which we've talked about. And another one is another interleukin IL-22. And another is GMCSS, CSF, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. And these cytokines are associated with pathogenesis, and particularly in a uh, model of uh, autoimmune encephalitis. Okay, so in IL-10 mice, um, there was more granzyme B compared to wild-type mice and IL-22. Um, so this is consistent with the Th17 cells perhaps doing that, producing those cytokines and causing the damage. <clears throat> Um, it's GMCSF. There's also a difference in the production of GS GMCSF uh, in the null mice. And again, that's been associated with pathogenesis. So basically, in the absence of IL-10, you have a lot of Th17, and GMCSF production is also increased. So that could have pathogenic uh, effects as well. Now, the last few sets of experiments are, are a little more, for me, are a little more difficult because they um, involve a new cell set and some other things that I haven't really um, learned about before. So if any of you know better, please jump in and correct me. No, this was news to me. I mean, most of this is news to me, <laughs> I, uh, but uh, this is even newsier. So TH17 cells, so t for these cells to develop, they need People have studied how they develop, and there are certain transcription proteins that are associated with de development, and they can be they can be um, kind of hallmarks of the particular cell. Uh, and there there's a transcription protein called TBET, T B E T, right? And this is new to me, but it's a it's a transcription factor involved in the development of of T cells. But they say Th17s don't actually need it; they also don't need interferon gamma produced by other cells. But um, s cells can acquire these proteins, uh, and that can parallel an increase in pathogenicity. Okay, and in particular, in other studies, mice lacking TBET are protected from uh, autoimmune encephalitis. This is a model where you inject mice with their own, um, not their own, but from similar mice, um, ground up spinal cord or brain antigens, and it develops an autoimmune encephalitis. So if you knock out TBET, those mice don't develop that autoimmune encephalitis. So they looked in the brains of these infected mice to see if they if TBET and another transcription protein called ROR gamma T, <laughs> another <laughs> hallmark of, of uh, TH cell development. Um, Wild-type mice mostly had TH1 cells, those are interferon gamma positive, TBET positive, and TH17 cells, which are marked by T, the IL-17 and ROR gamma T. I know this is really hard. <laughs> Very few. Now, there are apparently a subset of cells that have markers of TH1 and TH17. They're that somebody probably found. Right. <laughs> because... You know, going through this same thing at any rate. So those Th1 slash Th17 cells are interferon gamma positive and IL-17 positive. Okay. So this was news to me. These are cells that have properties of both, both Th1 and yeah. Th17, right? Yeah, because normally Th1s are, and 17 are very distinctive because they make different cytokines. That's how they're dis that's how they're defined, right? But apparently these have a mix of both, right? So. Right. But, I mean, you so, know, really, that's a theme in immunology. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, they define that, oh, these cells are Th1 and these cells are Th2. And then and then there's some cells that are kind of in between. It seems very common to me. Right, because so, the main tool for categorizing these yeah. is, is surface markers or secreted mm -hmm. markers. And, and you say, okay, well, this cell expresses this surface marker, yeah. but so does this cell. And the cells, of course, are expressing these proteins as as a way of accomplishing some jobs. So those that have similar jobs are going to have similar surface proteins. And then you get to stuff like this where, well, we thought these were all one population. And then it turns out that there are some that shift between the two and express both. Yeah. So we have a, there's a great human tendency and probably a science tendency to try and compartmentalize stuff. 
Yes. Uh, into right. little boxes and that kind of stuff. But nature is not that way. It's a lot grayer than we make it. So just to re- recount, the Th1 cells are defined by being interferon gamma positive and Tbet positive. Tbet is just a transcription protein that's important for their development. Th17 cells are defined by IL-17 and this other transcription protein, ROR gamma T. And then the hybrid cells have interferon gamma and IL-17. So one cytokine from both the Th1, which is the gamma, and the 17 from the Th17. I'm looking at this little development chart that I found, mm-hmm. uh, and it really helps with that because it's got Tbet, you know, differentiating CD4 positive naive T cells to Th1, blah, 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 what you said. Right. But it's a, it's a nice little description of that. Anyway, what they find is in mice lacking IL-10, you infect them with Synbis. We know already that Th17 goes up. We've already discussed that. There's also an increase in this Th1 slash Th17 population. Okay, so they're both going up, and that's, you know, again, these have been um, implicated in pathogenesis, so that's why they think this is significant here. Um, the the cells in the brains of both wild type and the IL-10 knockout mice that are interferon positive, uh, interferon gamma positive, those would make them. That's a Th1 signature. Also produce Tbet, um, and they don't produce ROR gamma T. So that means they're most likely classic uh, Th1 cells. Um, the 17 po- IL-17 positive cells also express ROR gamma T, which is, again, the, the canonical TH17 transcription protein, as well as Tbet, which is a marker of pathogenicity. So these, these IL-17 positive interferon gamma positive cells in the brains of the knockout mice are, both, are making both ROR gamma and Tbet. So in other words, to summarize all of this, uh, there, are, there are these pathogenic Th17 cells in the CNS when you get neurological disease, and there's also an increased number of Th1 slash Th17 cells, and that suggests that these are regulated by IL-10. So that's really, if you remember anything from this, the IL-10 absence is causing an increase in Th17 and Th1 slash Th17 cells, and apparently those are contributing, well, that's the hypothesis, those are contributing to the pathology course the next set of experiments is going to be how how do those cells do that what are they making that's causing the disease in the brain right and you'll do do that by knocking out specific proteins that are made by these cells and um you know obviously this is basic research but to to kind of tie it around to um to applications i mean where this is headed is you've got IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory, and it's normally suppressing the damage from these vi- from this virus. Um, and if you um, uh, now that we know what it's doing in there, what it's suppressing, um, we can we can find targets that you would aim for to try to reduce the damage. Because if you just suppress inflammation, that can be bad. Right. As the inflammation yeah. is there to clear out the virus, you probably would like to keep some of the inflammation, but you'd like to stop the cells that are actually doing the damage. And now this paper narrows you down to, to a, a sub-sub population of cells that are the most likely culprits in doing the damage, and then you can find out how they're doing that. I think eventually the, the idea would be to go as far as you can in identifying what the, the regulators of damage are, and then try and make modulators, make drugs that that block that or modulate that, and maybe those would be protective in people with encephalitis. Right, and you want it, but you want those to be as as narrowly targeted as of possible. Of course, yeah, because you don't want to cause some other problem or have the virus replicating unchecked. Right. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to just put everybody on on immunosuppressive drugs because then right. they'll die of other causes. So ordinarily, in a wild type infection or infection of wild type mice, there is some. Uh, infl- uh, some inflammation in the brain, which is uh, uh, it's immunopathogenesis. In the IL-10 knockout mice, you get more the nice mice die. The Th17 cells and Th17 Th1 cells are more abundant, so they're implicated yeah. in, as culprits in that. Okay, but 
that to me does not necessarily mean that it's the TH17, TH117 yeah. cells that are doing it in a wild type infection. It's a very good right. point. I want to see them. I want to see them do the experiment in a TH17 knockout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's possible. That's what you found from this base. One of the things you found is that that's the next thing, the next experiment to do. Exactly. You right. got it, Rick. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but that to me is where where I would want to go from there. You got it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. Because IL-10 does go up. Remember. So the the effect of IL-10 is to that's that's somewhat. right. Okay. So the implication, since I yeah I left out that part. Right. The the fact that IL-10 goes up in the in the wild type mice uh, really implicates uh, TH17 cells as maybe the culprit under normal circumstances. Yeah. But the TH17 knockout, uh, if such a thing exists, would be good. Does the TH17 knockout exist? Let's see. I tried to find that on I. Uh, mm didn't score but it was only a quick look while you guys were talking mm, yeah there there are th17 okay. knockout yep there's th17 or th17 receptor you can do both if you'd like so anyway that's that's the bottom line and if you uh, if, i know we have some immunologists listening if if we butchered any of this please let us know we'd like to learn yeah nice job vincent uh, I'm yes. glad. I'm glad you were on the front lines there, because that was tough. I I just want to learn this, but also I'm on the committee of this student who is um, studying this, so I I need to be smart, right? So I can make good comments. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I find it interesting. I always wanted to know if when you infect mice with polio, you know, they get paralyzed. What's causing the neuronal destruction? We don't is that, know. Is that immunopathogen? Is that immunopathogenic as well or is it just polio trashing in neurons do you know so apparently this following experiment is done if you infect rag knockout mice so rags don't have any b cells or t cells right mm-hmm. right they do not develop paralysis uh-huh. hmm. so um yeah maybe it's a th17 cell <laughs> I don't know. You know, the thing is, it would be really interesting to do these kinds of experiments with polio infected mice, but no one's doing that anymore because everyone's afraid, you know, with the eradication imminent that um, they'll be interrupted. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I I got rid of my mouse colony because no one in my lab was interested. It was too expensive to maintain. But boy, would I love to do some of these experiments with polio. I have a little dangerous knowledge of immunology now. (laughs) We actually have a department full of immunologists now. My yeah. my micro department has been reimagined and repurposed as an immunology department. There used to be virology and, and bacteria, but they're all gone with the exception of me and Steve Goff. And we have hired all new immunologists, and uh, I could collaborate with them. There you yeah. go. All right, let's read some email. Who would like to take this first long email? It's up for grabs. I can do it. Okay, go ahead. ahead. Mark Alexander writes, Hello to my favorite virologists. Here in Quebec, it's 4 degrees C, 39.2 Fahrenheit, (laughs) 277.15 Kelvin today, with some rain and big clouds. For this time of the year, it's really warm for us. In fact, we should now have... We should have snow later this week because we have a type of storm which is coming and the temperatures below zero degrees C in the night. I could go skiing before December. Finally, for the number crunchers, we have a barometric pressure of 101.4 kilopascals. Is that what the PA is? Yep. With 14 kilometers per hour of wind from the west and 76% humidity. I'm a native Canadian French speaker, so please pardon my French. (laughs) I'm listening to two of podcasts since August because I was searching for information about the Ebola virus outbreak. Yeah, somebody said that when we use only Ebola, we are talking about a river in Africa. And I have loved it from the beginning. To introduce myself, I will say that I'm 18-year-old student from Quebec. I'm saying that because Mr. Black and Yellow said that it was hard for you to know where the increasing, increasing listeners come from. And I'm studying in natural sciences at CGAP. I looked that up and now I forgot. C-E-G-E-P. Here, the CGEP is the way to pass between high school and university. Oh, yeah, here we go. 
I think it's the same thing as college in the Uncle Sam's country. In my case, it's hard to find people around me with knowledge in virology because I have physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology classes, but none of my teachers have real training in this TWIV science. With this situation, I'm trying to find information where I can develop my interest in virology, like with TWIV and the Society of General Microbiology Journals when they're free, and I can practice my English when I'm listening to your podcasts. It's way more interesting than the old episodes of Friends that I'm forced to watch by my old English teacher. <laughs> so in the next September, I would enter university in microbiology. I made this decision because since ninth grade, I was really interested in the micro world. But I think the human body is very nice to study, so I'll probably go into virology for my master and PhD. Maybe I'll go to school that's presenting TWIV from the Big Apple. Because here in Quebec, virology isn't very popular if I compare this to the PhD in microbiology, infectiology, immunology. In fact, I really enjoy your Ebola viruses special episodes and I have some points to join them about this. In my mind, we need BSL-4 and some money to work on a cure for Ebola virus that we have in Africa, but I think we should prepare for any virus outbreak that we can have after the Ebola one. With more money from the CDC, maybe scientists can find vaccines before we have any big cases in the human host. For sure, I think we need to work really hard on the vaccine. I would love to work on this, but like you, I know the persons who are the most exposed are the health workers. I'm suggesting to try to reduce the impact on those persons with some systems that we could install in the next years in preparation for another outbreak of any deadly virus. I have an idea, and please give me your opinion on this project. Every time I've listened to TWIV episodes of Ebola, I was thinking that maybe we want to find a perfect solution too fast when we should try to work on what we can control for now. All of those health workers who are infected in this outbreak are those on who we should try to find for whom we should try to find a way to reduce the contact between body fluids of an infected person and the staff. In my head, because the Ebola virus is supposed to be destroyed by UV and probably by hydrogen peroxide, uh, as is used in BSL-4 labs, to kill everything, then why don't we design a new type of room in some hospitals, like the one that took in the Ebola pa virus patient in Texas, with a negative pressure and a system that can disinfect all the fluids with hydrogen peroxide in the gas form and some UV ultra-powerful lights to destroy all the microorganisms that could be there. After this procedure with nobody in the room, someone could clean up the mess without being scared of being exposed to the deadly virus or viruses. Because of the outbreak, we could use them to treat patients in the U.S. who contract the virus, but we could also use them like normal rooms in the emergency room in the emergency service when we don't have any outbreak. In an easy way, the room would have some UV light with pipe for hydrogen peroxide in the gaseous form and negative pressure so the patient that uh, has an infectious disease can't really expose the staff. Like I said, we could build them in the way that, in case of another outbreak, we'd be ready to take patients quickly in isolation. More than that, the room could be usually used to take in patients that need special immunosuppressive treatments and be less exposed to the environment. Maybe if a case of tuberculosis or a more common disease that can be airborne or spread by air uh, makes some people sick, we would have the chance to have an emergency room fully equipped and ready to treat this kind of thing. More than that, special teams should work one year to be ready for taking care of patients who have this type of disease. They will know how to work in this environment and know how to take care of this patient without being dangerous for him or their own life. So I think he's saying they should probably train for at least a year. I don't really know uh, if, uh, without considering the cost, this could be a way to prevent this type of disease from being so deadly and if it could protect the health workers from body fluids. Maybe if it's not a great investment, if it won't be a, a, a big investment because the risks are not lower than a normal room with those of infected patients. Please give me your feedback on this. To close my letter and to make a little pause on the Ebola episodes, I, will, I would like to know how the rabies virus is traveling in the body of an infected patient. One time you said in a podcast that someone who gets the virus from a dog bite, for example, can live up to a year without symptoms because the virus needs to go to the central nervous system in the brain to begin the real damage. But I don't understand why it takes so much time for the virus to migrate from a bite to the brain. Does the virus travel in the limbs, in the blood? Does it follow the nerves? Bingo. I hope you could help me with this thing because I found a little bit of information in the open access scientific literature, but like I love to say, Wikipedia is Wikipedia. Thank you for your awesome podcast. I hope I'll have the chance to talk to you in person in the next years, next years or so. Um, and then I'll leave the very last comment for someone who can read the French. Ah, I would love to. Okay. Je vous remercie pour l'ensemble de vos œuvres et je dois dire que vous m'inspirez d'une très grande façon. Woo. 
That took many years of French. Apparently. Uh, uh, the rabies is easy. Go listen to the University of Georgia episode. Right. Right? Jean Fou talked about that, your old buddy, right? Mm-hmm. He, I think he really addressed all of his questions, so check that out. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure this room is such a good idea because, you know, they don't find a lot of virus in the actual room. They're pretty good at cleaning it. It's just a patient, and you can't decontaminate the patient, right? Right. If you could do that, you wouldn't have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what he wants to do is thoroughly decontaminate the room in between so that it can be used for other stuff as well. Yeah. I found a, a, a something that might interest him. If you just look for sanitizing hospital rooms, a bunch of uh, stories come up. There's some recent stories. There's some company that is uh, selling a UV robot <laughs> that will go around hospital rooms and zap everything with UV. It can be used to help sanitize. So it's not... That's not such a crazy idea. And negative pressure rooms are common in hospitals. They put, uh, that's they use for isolation and also for individuals who are uh, immunosuppressed um, so that um, they are not as exposed to stuff. Right. And there are, there are exactly these sorts of rooms in specialized places like Emory, uh, uh, Nebraska, um, and scattered Needle. around the country. So, um, those do exist. They're not part of the just ordinary hospital's infrastructure. Now, at the needle, if you guys remember, they when they oh. want to decontaminate, they get everybody out, they close the place, and they put gas in it. Yeah. So it's a it's a big deal. You know, they have to shut it down and all that. And I don't so. know what they use for gas. I don't. I uh, I don't know that you can uh, effectively vaporize hydrogen peroxide. Usually, from you can. Yeah, you can. Formaldehyde. There's you can vaporized hydrogen uh, peroxide vapor, and it's used. Uh, as a low temperature antimicrobial vapor to decontaminate laboratory workstations, isolation, and pass through rooms, oh, okay. and even aircraft interiors. Okay. I think in the needle they were using vaporized um, formaldehyde. Yeah. But um, I think they do pretty well in decontaminating the rooms between patients, at least here in the U.S. I don't know about there in, in Africa how they're doing, but uh, um, I think that this high this kind of tech wouldn't be possible in a tent based hospital right 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 and to even even in a u.s based hospital to expect every hospital or even a lot of hospitals to adopt this sort of thing i mean as soon as you put medical grade on something you quadruple the price yep um and hospitals are are going bankrupt right now um so i don't know maybe up in canada where they have that evil socialized medicine they could get something like this done (laughs) but it's not going to happen here Alan, can you take the next two? Yes, I'll take the... Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Kathy got the, the raw end of that. Okay, so Robin writes, Thanks for the podcasts, especially the rabies and mumps episodes. Excellent insights. Wish you were here uh, before I retired in 2009. Is that our must- usual Robin? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Really? So, I, you know, I looked at this and I thought, if that's the usual Robin, what's going on here? And I, my immediate reaction is, I wonder if this is a haiku. Uh, but it's got too many. It's got too many syllables. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or, or a very very old letter, or the first one Robin wrote us, or something. Something you know. like that. Uh, yeah, it's the same Robin. Yep. Okay. Just looked up the original email. All right. Uh, next up, Anne writes, "Dear professors at TWIV, I'm currently in an introductory epidemiology course on Coursera, epidemics, the dynamic of infectious diseases, and someone posted a question about the efficacy of flu vaccine." which has led to some discussion of the need for healthy people to get the vaccine. Another respondent pointed out that flu vaccine is said to be 60 to 70 percent effective, which I confirmed via Wikipedia. The original poster had this to say in response to the info on Wikipedia. Sorry to be attaching a screenshot. It was the easiest way to get his points across. Um, And I'm now... I looked at this earlier. What was... uh, That's a bunch of stuff about how about the CDC's all wrong. Yeah, the, the vaccine figures. companies are scamming the U.S. by having everybody vaccinated, and they're making a fortune. And there's only a thousand. CDC is lying because there's only a thousand influenza-related deaths yearly instead of thirty thousand. Right. Um, it's a conspiracy. Right. So I responded that even at thirty-five percent, the quoted effectiveness of the seasonal flu vaccine, given the population size in the U.S., the reduction of the incidence of flu at that level. 
uh, likely has economic and social impacts. Fewer sick people, fewer lost work days, lower health care costs, etc. I know the TWIV team has talked about flu vaccine efficacy before, but could you speak to this again or perhaps create a blog entry for it? The thread also mentions that in the UK, only children and the elderly, the at-risk population, are encouraged to get flu shots, which is different from US policy. Would appreciate hearing your comments about this too. Many thanks, Anne. P.S. An update to my earlier note, I found your blog post, which responds to the same Lancet article that the original poster in the Coursera discussion did. You seem to share the same views, although Alan Dove's critique of the Lancet findings is good. As we enter the flu season, perhaps reposting the links uh, to your and Alan's blog entry might begin to show casual readers how even scientists can disagree, also part of the process of science, about these kinds of studies. Um, Okay, so, Anne, this happens to be a topic that I... uh, that I write about just about every year. Um, the uh, let's start with the UK thing. Uh, the recommendation for children and the elderly, high risk populations. That actually used to be the same in the US. Um, there were specific populations recommended <clears throat> for flu vaccine, um, and also anybody can get it if they really want it. Um, that mostly led to confusion because. Uh, you know, fairly easy to say when somebody's a child, but when is somebody elderly? Uh, are you frail? Are you at risk? Um, and then these different messages for different populations uh, weren't terribly helpful. So they finally, just two years ago, I think, went to a universal flu vaccine recommendation, which is if you're over the age of six months, get a flu shot. This reminds me of the discussion we had about immunizing uh, all children against hepatitis B at birth, birth yes. rather than trying to identify the ones who might be particularly at risk. In the end, it's uh, in all ways, and, and there was actually for the hepatitis B, I think there was actually a cost-benefit analysis done of this. It's uh, cheaper and more effective just to get everyone because otherwise you don't, you, you, uh, people slip through the cracks. Yeah. And it's not just old and young. There's a bunch of other risk factors. The the Lancet article, Alan, is that the meta analysis that uh, we discussed before? I think that is. I think that's what that is. Yeah, we yeah, we so did talk is- about that some time ago, and and that, and remember, Michael Osterholm use that to say that we need a better vaccine obviously right right and absolutely everybody involved with flu research will tell you we need a better vaccine um now osterholm's meta-analysis is uh is not perfect either um there are kind of two ways you can go with a meta-analysis you can include everything and try and get useful information out of it or you can set very high standards and include fewer studies and get try to get useful information out of it he set very high standards um I won't delve into our whole discussion of that, but I, I, I'll say, you know, he, he had parameters like uh, this had to be, um, uh, it, it had to be papers that showed um, efficacy based on, uh, on a demonstration of virus in the blood. Right. Um, so right. you automatically eliminate decades of the literature before we had PCR tests for flu virus. Um it just, <laughs> um, and there, there are a lot of, uh, we've talked at some length about some yep. of the difficulties, you know, when there's a mismatch in the virus and this and that. Um, I will, however, um, in response to, to this discussion in general, I'm just going to pop this link. Yeah, in put here. your put your post in there, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm popping in the, uh, the, the CDC. CDC. Stick your blog post, too. I'll put them all in the show notes. Oh, yeah. Uh you can so find I'll that. take that up. Um, so the CDC has lots of information on this, including an update on the 2014 to 15 flu season. Kathy has just posted in the key facts uh, page from them. Um, the current situation with the flu season, because I get these emails every week, is <laughs> that um, there is uh, not a perfect match between the vaccine and the mm-hmm. circulating strains. About half the ones they've they've. Um, they've analyzed uh, dozens of samples, uh, so this is not a not an incredibly robust sample, but they're from all over the country. Um, and about half of them are viruses that are not a good match to the current vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, the other half are. So you know, there's that. Um, the question then comes up: Well, if it, if the virus is not a good match for the current vaccine, how much protection do the, does the vaccine provide? And that gets into some very very murky data. It may you may actually get pretty good protection even across 
drifted viruses. You may not, um, you know, this 35% number is one that people sometimes throw out as an overall average, but in fact, it varies across a wide range. Um, the one thing that we know for sure is that the side effects of the flu vaccine are virtually non-existent, and the benefits are real, even if they're not as robust as they would be for a lot of other vaccines. So there's not really a lot of downside, especially now that just about everybody can get this vaccine for free. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get your flu shot. Even if you're healthy, you probably would rather not have this virus. I certainly would rather not have this virus. Okay. And it will it it is it is something that is protective. Um, even if it doesn't fully protect you from the flu, it will likely protect you from getting a worse version of it. Uh, the CDC also has calculations for the payoff from all this to society, and we're talking about um, it, you know hundreds of millions of dollars saved in lost productivity and all this from uh, averted cases of flu or less severe cases of flu based on the best available data. Yep. So it's what? it's worthwhile as an individual and it's worthwhile as a society. One thing I wanted to point out that I learned when Jeff Taubenberger was here last year is that the 30,000 deaths per year that many of us have always quoted, uh, it's now been recommended that we cite a range yeah, sure. uh, from 1976 to 2006. Uh, the range has been from a low of 3,000 to a high of 49,000 49, deaths. Yep. Yeah, I, I always do that, yeah. it's Because it's not always 30,000, right? Uh, for some... Uh, newbies listening in, um, they may be uh, wondering why the new virus, this season's virus, is not a perfect match. And uh, basically, um, every year, the, the strains can drift a lot, and every year the um, CDC is uh, doing a global survey of what's coming up, and they have s six months lead time to make the vaccine, and sometimes you get it right, and sometimes you don't quite get it right. All right. Uh, Rich, can you take the next two? Sure. Aisha writes. She gives a couple of links um, and then says, I wonder if you guys had heard of this postdoc initiative in Boston. I am peripherally involved in supporting and offering ideas. We hope to continue building momentum in bringing postdocs post mm -hmm. to the table when reforms are negotiated. And the links are to... A, uh, a science article that talks about this postdoc organization and jeez uh, did I miss uh, here it is uh, a link to the this site which oh no that's Alan's it's um, ah, I lost it it's uh, future of research, future of research right? dot org yeah. so uh, this is a group of postdocs in the Boston area who have organized themselves uh, in response basically to a lot of the opinions that have come out about changes that need to be made in how scientific uh, research is done or uh, how education in scientific research is done, how careers are managed, that kind of stuff. Should we have as many PhDs? Should we have as many postdocs? What sort of jobs should there be for postdocs? There are problems, in, as we've discussed before, in how the scientific enterprise is uh, working now. And uh, one of the points that's made here is most of the conversation comes from uh, uh, very experienced, advanced uh, investigators uh, and it would be good to have uh, some input from postdocs. And so here's a group of postdocs that is providing input. This is good. They should. They should yeah. have a voice, right? I think that's great. Yep. Yeah, because the, the senior people came up through, no offense <laughs> to present company, but came up in a very different time. Um, are you it, calling us hey. senior? <laughs> well, interpret from this <laughs> What does that mean? Left. Does it mean it was easier? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, the yes. statistics will mm. back me up on this. It yeah. was a heck of a lot easier to get a PI position, to get a grant, when there were a lot fewer scientists um, and there was more money proportionally. And that has gotten progressively harder and harder in a, an almost logarithmic curve. Um, 
so that the the postdocs now who are standing around on their third or fourth postdoctoral position looking at this this bleak landscape where they're not going to get PI positions, they're not going to get jobs. I mean, those are just the facts. There, there are 200 people applying for each tenure track research position. Um, and that's presuming you can actually get a grant in the current environment as a junior investigator. Um, these folks are not happy. And when the senior folks get together, they don't see the problem because they don't have the problem. You know, they're employed, they're tenured, they're getting the grants because they're at the top of the food chain. Um, and I, I think it's great that these postdocs are organizing this and and going to provide this perspective. I, I, you know, the, the, the Alberts paper, which we talked about on TWIV, I, I don't think they said there is no problem. But right. I think the point is that the postdocs and, and the junior people should be involved in figuring out whatever reform is going to be handled. Exactly. Right? Yeah, Alberts, Alberts did not say, to their credit, they actually looked at it and, and and admitted outright that this is very different, but they got a lot of resistance from other senior people in science um, who just lit into them and said, no, you're reading this all wrong. And yeah, the yeah, voice that was missing, as they said, was um, was the voice of the people who were actually directly affected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And in other news... The uh, NIH budget went up by a paltry 0.5 percent. No, lovely. In the new, uh, in the new uh, funding bill. Continuing a long-standing tradition of raising it less than uh, sector inflation. Yep. Right. The uh, it's uh, something like still less than it was in what 2004 or something like that. Yeah. I forget exactly what the statistic is, but it's not nice. Hmm. All right. Thanks for that, uh, Yisha. We'll put those yes. links in and, and people good can luck. see and, them. And yes. good, 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 good on you for doing that. And let us know if you need some help with publicizing stuff. Yeah, twiff bump. Twiff yes. bump. Take the next one, Rich. Uh, Abe writes, hi. I just started binge listening to the episodes, all the episodes of Twiv and Twip from beginning. <laughs> These are great. As an interested scientist in a completely different field, I want to ask, Twiv, are there archaeophage viruses and are there prions for archaea yours abe well yes there are phage for uh, archaea and they are weird <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i don't know about prions yeah i don't know either well of course we say they're weird because we're eukaryotes that's true so th there are lots of dna phages of archaea and you may remember ken stedman was on Twiv a while ago. He feels like he has a RNA phage of archaea, mm -hmm. which he got from a hot spring, but I don't know if he's got the host down yet. But if you go to ASV this summer, he'll be talking, and you can hear. I don't know about prions, but... Um, I'd be surprised if there weren't. Yeah, probably are. Certainly yeast have them. All right, uh, let's do Clark here. Dear Twiv, long-time listener, but glad you're finally moving on from Ebola. <laughs> My original background is actually physics, not chocolate-making. Way back in the 90s, physics moved to putting papers online for free at the Los Alamos Physics Repository, which is now archive.org. Today, it's rare not to find papers in the preprint repository. It has been an overwhelming success and I think has aided the evolution of ideas in physics. Other fields have moved in the same direction. For instance, bioarchive.org handles biology papers. For some subfields, like evolution or genomics, do very, very well posting papers here. Other fields, such as neurology, seem to do poorly. I hope you can perhaps use your bully pulpit to push for microbiologists to use this resource. For physics, often even papers published in prominent journals end up at archive, whereas for too much biology, it seems like the papers are not seen unless their library carries the journal. This is problematic for many reasons, not the least of which is access by the public to the research they typically are paying for through their taxes. It also goes against the spirit of science, which requires open communication. Thanks for your consideration. I'm sure from past discussions you've had that you are proponents of open journals. I just point out that in physics and related disciplines, they've gone much farther to the point that it is the standard. We did, we did uh, mention BioArchive. I think it was my pick some time ago. I think so. Yeah. Now, Alan, you you understand the difference between physics and biology, right? Um, physics is stuff that goes boom, and biology is stuff that moves. <laughs> I brought <laughs> I brought this up a while ago, and you said, "Well, physics is a much smaller field, so this kind of open publishing works uh, yes. because of that." Is that correct? Uh, that's my read on it, um, because there are, there are fewer physics papers than there are biology papers, and there are fewer, mm. you know, physicists 
um, doing the the basic research, or at least um, when maybe they, maybe there are a lot of physicists, but they're all working on one project. Mm. So you get these papers with three thousand authors. Um, so I, I think this do, this has worked better for physics because it's a smaller, tighter knit community. Um, whereas biology, I mean, do you include medicine? Do you include um, uh, zoology? Do you what it, what it, what counts as biology in this setup? And how are people going to find the papers that they want? Um, or are you going to end up with a plus one type of problem where it's just gazillions of papers all the time and nobody mm. can ever find anything until it gets you know randomly picked and promoted on the internet? So is there a peer review of these physics sites? Or you just post your no, paper? No, you just post your paper. You just post your paper. This is a um, this is an old tradition from mathematics, I think, that people would would mail their formulae around and, and their proofs to other mathematicians um, just informally, and they'd collaborate with each other that way, and then they might finally publish it at some point. And physicists started th doing the same thing on the Internet um, and actually started the World Wide Web as a result. I thought Al Gore did that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, so this, yeah, these are, in a lot of cases, I think on archive, these are just preliminary works, and that brings up the whole question of open notebooks and um, at what point do you put your stuff online and how is your tenure committee going to feel about this? Yeah. And, and of course, in biology, we're also somewhat obsessed with the... Um, Impact uh, factor yeah. with the impact factor and the the vanity journals and if you do just put your stuff online, nature's not going to publish it because it's already been published. Um, so there are my a lot biggest of issues. my biggest concern would be the peer review issue. Yeah. So, so I have a, a, a colleague here, Raul Rabadan, who used to be a physicist, and he said they all put their papers on archive when it comes when it comes for tenure. The tenure committee downloads them, they read them, and they decide whether you have done something good. That sounds very civilized. And um, it, so, but again, that may work because it's a small field. I just don't know. Now, BioArchive, I know that Jesse Bloom is public. He puts his papers there before he publishes them elsewhere. But as you said, Alan, not every journal will accept something that's already been on BioArchive. So that's a limitation. Yeah. And um, there's also the issue that um, there's quackery that people would dump into a non peer reviewed repository. Um, sure, sure. And of course, there's there are cranks in physics who are proving that the Earth is flat, and then they can they can, you know, square the circle or what have you. Um, but they're easy to ignore. They're not doing anything that's going to grab headlines. If somebody dumps a paper saying vaccines cause aut autism into a non-peer-reviewed repository and says, "Look, it's published in the the standard repository," then you're going to get all the nut jobs coalescing around that. Yeah. All right, let's do one more, Kathy. Sure. Johnny writes, gentle folks, I wonder if Alan Alden knows about TWIV. See below. <laughs> and she provides a link to an article in the American Association of Medical Colleges that's an interview with Alan Alda. Uh, Johnny continues, they offer improvisation. Of course, you and your fellow TWIVisians, rhymes with Nevisians, the adjective form for Nevis, <laughs> could easily <laughs> offer and teach. And she gives the link to that. So uh, there's the Alan Alda Center for Commuting communicating science at Stony Brook and so they apparently have uh, summer workshops for students and postdocs and they have an improvisation for scientists program that uh, is to teach uh, not to turn the scientists into actors but to free them up to be able to talk about their work spontaneously uh, pay attention to listeners and connect personally with their audience um, there's one line in the uh, or one question in the interview that where he says uh, something to the effect that, oh yeah, when I hosted Scientific American Frontiers, we communicated more through a conversational approach than we did through a lecture. Oh. And uh, uh, so I think that that's why, <laughs> that's what made Johnny think of us because we try to talk about having conversations rather than yeah. lectures. So I met, uh, I was at a, on a, I'm on a committee where the dean of the School of Journalism at Stony Brook is on the committee. So he knows Alda very well. So I said, I emailed him afterwards. I said, nice meeting you. Would you please uh, tell Alan about our initiatives? And he just wrote back, uh, nice meeting you. <laughs> he just clearly didn't want to do it. I would love him to see it because 
I think what he's doing is really cool, but there are some of us out here who are communicating, and I'd love to hear his thoughts. And we do we, think that conversation is a good way to convey information. Yes. We talked about getting him on the show uh, at some previous time, and as yeah. I recall, we decided that we, he's got people for that. We would have to talk to yes. his people. Yeah, right? yeah, we don't do that. We don't do that here on TWIF, right? All right, let's take. I don't some, have any people. <laughs> yeah, we do would I. have to have our people talk to his people. I don't, so we don't have people. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Someone said to me once, "Why do you take so long to answer your emails?" And I said, "Well, I don't have people. <laughs> it's all me, and I just I'll get to it." Let's do some picks. Okay. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have something. I don't know how I found this. <laughs> oh, I know how I found it. Somebody posted it on Facebook. It's uh, a, like a... Full selection. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh, that was you. Okay. Well, I, I was afraid it was me. Uh, it is a short film, three minutes and 50 seconds long, called Wanderers. It's by a guy named Eric uh, Vern Christ. Quist is how I would uh, pronounce it. And he is a digital artist and animator from Stockholm, Sweden, who's also a sort of futurist space geek. And he's put together this film, short film, in, you know, digital art about uh, what space exploration in the far future might look like. Uh, and it's uh, it's laid over a narration of Carl Sagan about humans wandering the universe. And I just really liked it. I thought it was cool. I thought good. it was very yeah. artistic, very imaginative. He uses all, uh, he he claims that he's using all, you know, real sort of planets and scenes, okay, and then imagining the rest, though. A lot of it is inspired by science fiction works from the past. I just thought it was fun to watch. Really, I finally figured out I could turn the volume off and watch the video now. Yeah, I'm stupid. I know. It's good. Oh. It's it, you. You do want to do nice. it ultimately with the uh, nice. with the with the sound on because you Beautiful. get Carl Sagan talking yeah. to you. Hey, Rich, I bought uh, The Martian after your recommendation. Oh, you did? Yeah, I'm reading it. It's really good. Uh, I finished it. I really like. Do you realize? So <laughs> one thing we didn't talk about that is that that guy. You said it was cheap. He originally self published it. Oh, stuck it online, and it was just doing such, uh, doing so well that a publisher picked it up, mm. and he said that he got not only the publisher picking it up, but somebody buying the film rights all in the same week. Wow! And he's just, you know, this guy just did this for fun, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, his life has changed. Well, good for him because yeah, it's, it's really a great job. Well, you know, I'm reading it. I'm thinking Dixon should read it because it's really all about indoor farming. <laughs> yes, I thought of Dixon as well. That's yeah. right. But, uh, I told him about it, and he poo-pooed it. He said, Pota ah. potatoes? Give me a break. Come on, Dixon. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I picked a book called The Sense of Style, The Thinking Person's Guide to Writing in the 21st Century. The author is Steven Pinker, and uh, the other podcast that I listened to, Away With Words, recommended this book. And this is, uh, in a way, a 21st century uh, replacement for uh, Strunk and White's elements of style. They pointed out that I think it's uh, Will Strunk, who was born in 1869 or something, and language does evolve. So uh, uh, I read the New York Times review of it as well. Uh, the People on this other podcast are very enthusiastic about it as a uh, m more uh, tractable, tractable uh, style thing that isn't very, uh, isn't as rigid with rules and things that are maybe from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's gotten some pretty good reviews in various places. And I imagine Alan has something to say about it too. I have not read it, so I'm ah, going to okay. <laughs> I'm going to withhold uh, uh, judgment of it. Uh, setting a pretty high bar to say it's a replacement for elements of style because that's, well, that's kind of my that's my yeah. Bible. But <laughs> that, that's that's my text. Um, some the title suggests that it's yes. as the reviewer says uh, meant to supplant the classic text. Right. Um, so yeah, I, what I uh, what I liked about the 
New York Times write up on this, which I uh, re- review of it, which I read, is that his basic um, goal is clarity. Right. Absolutely clarity. And he's willing to sacrifice some of the common grammar rules for the sake of clarity. That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. Alan, what have you got? Um, I have a site that I just recently stumbled on. I don't know if this has been a pick for TWIM, um, but no. uh, nope. it could have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a blog called It Came From The Pond, and it's a um, uh, the, the writer is an amateur scientist, an amateur um, protistologist. Um, he likes pulling water out of a pond and putting it on a microscope and looking at it looking at the, the protozoans that are swimming around there. and um, So he's got his own interests, but then he also interviews other people who are into the same thing. And they have, you can link to their, to their websites from there. Um, some of these folks have built really impressive microscopy labs in their basements. Cut this. It's better than yeah, mine. It's a scanning him yeah. in his basement. Yes, exactly. You scroll yes. <laughs> this first interview that, that he's got on the page. I, somebody yeah. sent me this link and I was looking at it and I was like, Good Lord. <laughs> this is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so he's got how a, much got does a, a scanning EM cost? At least a hundred grand. I, I think he probably picked it up used. You can but, get used uh, ones on on, on uh, eBay. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. A nice, but, you know, uh, it's a nice fucking lab. And, and to set something like that up, but, you know, you think about what do people get into as their hobbies. Maybe they rebuild old sports cars or something, and they've got a whole garage decked out for that. Well, these people are into microscopy, and this guy's got a lab and his and he's not the only one there's there's the author of this blog there's the guy he's got in that first interview and then if you keep going he's got um he's got other folks he's talked to who are doing similar things and it's in this this ancient tradition of amateur microscopy that goes all the way back to Leeuwenhoek of course um and I just think this is really cool so you can buy one for less than 10 grand on eBay yeah I was just looking at that now, of course, of course, you're going to have to set it up, and you're going yeah. to have to uh, prepare your it's samples. Beautiful. But he spent some money on this. Uh, yeah. Have any of you guys uh, actually ever used a scanning electron microscope? No, I've used. Because I, I have as an one. undergraduate, and it is a blast. It's so easy. You just you just plunk stuff on a on a a little chuck, and you stick it in the scope, and have a look at it, and it's just mind boggling. All right, I'm getting one. There you go. <laughs> Put it yeah. in your basement. Yeah, cool. Do you need like liquid nitrogen or anything like that? I don't think so. No? It depends. I think it depends on what you're preparing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these things that he does, uh, uh, I think he's do, do, doing um, uh, various types of staining that you do for EM, and that can get kind of tricky. It's cool, but neat stuff. Neat, very cool. Yeah, I can't quite find it. Oh, now here it is. It's pinard.de and that was something that I linked to from this and it has a series of really cool pictures Mm -hmm. yes so that I I can't retrace my steps but this is the guy this is the guy he's interviewing in this first post ah okay Um, so it came from the pond is the site um, that I'm picking but then if you go to the guy who happens to be interviewed in this first post he's got pinard.de which um, he just posts photos of various things that he's found under the micro- microscope and one of these guys is a school teacher and another one you know does something else and they're they're not professional scientists they just think the stuff is cool and i agree yep yes neat uh, my pick is a book about phage uh this uh next year will be the centennial of the discovery of phage oh 1915. So there will be a meeting in San Diego to celebrate that in January. They have a website that explains what's going on. But if you scroll down the website, you will see a link to a book called Life in Our Phage World, which is basically a field guide to 30 different phages, beautifully written and incredibly illustrated. Mm -hmm. You can download for free a high or a low resolution version, PDF, of this book. You can also buy it on Amazon for 75 bucks, But here it is, and they want us to share the links freely. Cool. So it's an amazing book. It's really nicely written, and as I said, the illustrations are awesome. So go for it. Cool. Neat. Very neat. That's a TWIV gift to uh, everybody this year. 
because <laughs> I don't know if you would have found it otherwise. You mean you're not going to get everybody phone cases? <laughs> I'm not sure everybody wants a Twiv phone case. <laughs> and everybody has different phones, too. That's right. Uh, we have a listener pick from Fernando who writes, maybe this is too political for Twiv, but it really nails the perennial issue of fear-mongering. Is anything too political for Twiv? Oh, I'm sure. Some, we haven't too. really done the test. No. <laughs> Anyway, it's a Doonesbury cartoon, um, and it kind of is about epidemics, and I'll, I'll let you watch it. It's reality-based. Yes. It's really quite interesting. Doonesbury, so, Doonesbury has been a lifelong favorite of mine. Yep. Yeah. So thanks, Fernando, and it'll do it for TWIV316. And you can find this one and all the others at twiv.tv, also on iTunes. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them to TWIV at twiv.tv. I think in the new year we'll do an email episode very quickly. We should do an all-email yes. episode. We have a bunch. Someday. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. This did, always makes my day. Did you have any pizza this past week as you discussed? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, very shortly... After the last uh, TWIV, I forget exactly when it was, uh, I went to Satchel's for lunch. Excellent. You know, because I just, I had it on my mind. I just had to do it. It was great. God, Excellent. Great. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's also on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>